Okay, Peter, that's we're good to go. Brilliant. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're well. Um, despite the, the beautiful image of the Scrimger building, the home of Dundee Law School behind me, I am not actually in Dundee this afternoon speaking to you. As some of you know, particularly those of you at Bridgehouse College, uh, those of you at GEC Academy, uh, at uh, Oxbridge College, at, at uh, DIV, uh, and at Westerfield College, you know that I am currently this week in the great city of Lagos in Nigeria. And it has been wonderful to meet many of you in person, students who are participating in our mooting training and who will go on to participate in our internals competition and ultimately our international competition. And this is something I hope to do to, for all the participating schools over the course of this academic year, to meet with you in person, to, to give you advice and a masterclass on mooting. Sorry, my car's moving. So <laughs> it's just been shaking around a little bit. So I've been delighted to answer specific questions over the last two days in Nigeria. Uh, and uh, I can feed back to the team that, that the, uh, the students from our schools who are participating are so full of pleasure and gratitude for all the great guidance that you have been giving them. Uh, so we're very, very excited to be continuing with our lectures today. Uh, and today, Kelsey and the great team are going to be introducing you to legal writing. We're going to be circulating the two problems uh, next week, so you can begin to look at them. You have the judgments pack, and you now can begin to see how the judgments in those packs, how they pertain to the internals problem, and ultimately, you can then look to see how they pertain to the uh, problem that we're using for the international competition this year. So again, thank you all for attending, whether you're joining live or you're watching the recording. I know many of the students I've spoken to this morning are, are, are enjoying watching recordings of these sessions. Even if you do join live, feel free to go back uh, over the material covered uh, on the recording at your leisure. I do encourage you to ask questions in the, uh, the Q&A function. Uh, and uh, so I will leave you now. I'm gonna have to drop off because I think my internet is, is, is going to end very, very soon. But I leave you in the capable hands of, of Libby and Kelsey, and I hope you have a really productive session. Next week, I'll be able to join you for the full time because I'll be back in Dundee, uh, and I uh, look forward to doing the training sessions, which are coming up very, very soon in the next few weeks. So Kelsey, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, has, just before we get started today on today's lecture of legal research and writing skills, um, does Libby have any housekeeping things? I do, just thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Professor Peter, for, for joining us. It was a, a, a fantastic to have you join us from, from Nigeria. Um, a quick note about the Q&A and chat function. So I know that our students have an interactive session lined up for you today. Um, we would love for you to answer questions. And if you feel confident enough and would like to answer those questions verbally, then please raise a hand uh, and I will unmute you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, then you can either use the Q&A function, which is uh, the double speech bubble, or just the chat function, which is the single speech bubble. Um, please do let us know which school you're joining us from in the chat function. And if there are any questions at all, um, we are happy to verbalize those questions throughout the session. So don't leave it all to the last minute. Make sure you ask questions as you go um, so that the students can answer all of the relevant, give all of the rele relevant answers at that moment in time. I think that's enough from me over to, oh, one more thing. Actually, we are looking to schedule um, your one-to-one -one workshops um, for the weeks beginning the 14th and the 21st of November. I know a couple of schools have got back to me, very much appreciated, thank you. Um, but if all of the other schools taking part could send me details of all of the available times um, during those two weeks for the, for the two workshops, um, then I can start that scheduling process. Let me know if you have any questions and don't forget to join our WhatsApp group if you, uh, if you would like to. Okay, over to you, Kelsey. Thanks, Libby. Um, I'll just get the PowerPoint up for this uh, week's lecture. Oh, Libby, you need to let me, you need to give me permission. Apologies. Um, but just um, for anyone watching, uh, if you have any questions about last week's um, seminar, just let us know. Technology these days. I've now made you all um, co-hosts, just in case.
Okay. Um, so yeah, like I've said, today's seminar is about legal research and writing skills. So although we will be giving you a judgment pack of cases to use and you won't actively have to go and kind of find cases yourself, uh, this session will be really important in understanding how to get key information from certain cases and how to use cases to your advantage and also how to make sure the, the way you write your oral, the way you write your speech that you're going to give to the judge is made in, in a cohesive and kind of organized manner and so I'll just pass over to um, I think it's is it Hannah doing these slides thank you, thank you Kelsey so um, for today's lecture we hope that by the end of it firstly you'll be able to read a case report um, you'll understand where the law is or where it can be found you can identify whether a case is binding on a court Hopefully you'll be able to construct strong legal arguments and understand how to create a bundle and a skeleton argument. As Kelsey has mentioned, um, for this competition, the bundle is given in the form of a mooting pack. So you will not need to create your own bundle and everything related to the judgment should be with you now. Thank you. Oops, I'll just move that slide if that's okay. Um, let's see. Sorry, Kelsey, could you move it to the next slide? <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. So um, just a recap of what we spoke about last week, which was all about mooting. So what is mooting? It is a competitive mock court appeal case. So teams will present submissions for each party and you will try to persuade the judges that the interpretation of the law that you are presenting is correct. Now, each moot has two teams competing against each other. If we could just get a really quick answer of what these two sides are called, I'll give a hint. One side is called the appellant, and then the other side would be, let me just check the chat. Does anyone know what the answer would be? So there, so there are the appellants, and then the, let's see. Anybody can go for it? Perhaps type it in the chat and I'll just check the Q&A function just in case. I'm manning the Q&A as well, so don't worry, I can <laughs> help you with this. So we have one answer, which is which is a defendant. Perfect. And there's another one come in called the respondents. Yes. And we I'm have appellant and defendant. Thank you for your answers. Um, that's great. Well, we would call in this case the appellant and the respondents, but defendant technically is not incorrect. But yes, it would be the appellant and the respondents. So during um, this moot or this competition where there are the appellants and the um, respondents competing against each other, you will be tested on your advocacy skills. So how well you present on the day, um, you know, the clarity of what you're saying, and of course your legal knowledge. So the research that you've put in and the um, arguments that you will be submitting on the day. So during um, your submissions or during these arguments, you will be asked by the judge or judges questions, and this is called judicial intervention. Perfect, next slide, thank you. So how will your moot be judged? Now there will be several factors that will be taken into consideration when deciding which team has won the moot. But as you can see, there are just certain points that have been um, highlighted in green and in bold. So I think the focus would be on your analysis of the law and the problem, the structure of your legal argument, the teamwork aspect, so how well you split the points with your teammate? Do you look like um, you understand each other's arguments? Does it seem cohesive to the judge? And of course, the relevance of authorities that you have chosen according to the moot problem. Of course, there are other elements such as the oral presentation, so how you present, um, how clearly you speak. Um, there's the etiquette, so whether you address the judge in the polite and appropriate manner, how you respond to the judicial intervention, to the judge's questions, and the effectiveness of your rebuttal, and of course, the use of time. So if I'm not wrong, this competition will be seven minutes per um, person. So make sure that when you are drafting or writing your legal argument, make sure that your speech is not meant for a 10 minute speech. Make sure it's you know five to six minutes. Leave a bit of space for when the judges want to ask you questions. 
during your submissions. Perfect. Next slide, if that's okay. Yeah, could you move it to the next slide? Oh, okay, yeah, perfect. So, oops, sorry, the moot problem slide. Perfect, thank you. So the moot problem, um, as Peter mentioned, he will be circulating it sometime next week. So the moot problem will consist of the names of the parties, who are the appellants, who are the respondents, the facts of the case, the court of first instance, and the decision that was made by the judge at that at first instance. So the grounds of appeal, and the court that the moot will be heard in. Now, it can be very overwhelming when you see the moot problem, because it's just so many words. But this is how I would break it down, just to make it less overwhelming. So firstly, it's so important to make sure that you know um, which side you are arguing for. So you need to know if you are the appellant or the respondent, because that really affects um, what you are arguing for. Secondly, you need to ensure that you have a proper understanding of the main issues in the moot problem. So what I like to do when I see a moot problem is I would read it at least three times. I would probably explain it to a friend who doesn't know what the moot problem is, just so that I really know that I am clear on the facts of the case and the moot itself. Then third, you need to split the points of appeal with your teammates. So this is when you can get the um, teamwork points. Um, and finally, you need to research cases or legislation you can use in your submission. Now, so as we mentioned, the moot problem has so many details. So how do you actually approach the moot problem itself? So as I mentioned earlier, familiarize yourself with the facts of the case and the grounds of appeal. So um, whilst you're reading um, the facts, you can also think about cases that are related to it or could support um, the grounds of appeal or the grounds of response. Make sure you know which court will be hearing your case. And of course, read any cases that are mentioned in the problem. Um, because usually um, it will provide, it will support aside. So if it supports you and you are the respondent, then obviously you can use that case and reiterate what was already mentioned by the judge. But as an appellant, it would also be important to understand what was argued and how you can rebut that and go against it. And of course, read the relevant area of the textbook, of the textbook and note down any helpful quotes or case names. Now, what if you get stuck? Don't panic, as you can see in bold, do not panic. Um, sometimes the law may not be on your side and it may be difficult to create an argument, but just remember that there is no one correct answer. So if you feel like the law is not on your side, this is your chance to show off your legal creativity. So for this competition, uh, you'll have a full case report that you'll be able to use that we'll give to you. And that you'll also have a summary which has the ratio decedendi from the judges. We covered what ratio decedendi is before, but just in case anyone isn't quite sure, it's the legal principles, which would be kind of towards the end of a judgment that a judge would give. And you can also read the textbooks that you've been given as well to widen your knowledge. So for each case, the things that you should be aware of when you're looking at it are the facts of the case. So the basic facts would be what the party's names are, the year, the issue, and the outcome. Uh, also the court it was heard in, because that will be quite important if there's judicial intervention, a judge may ask you, is this case binding? So what court is it in? Uh, the ratio decedendi of the case, the judges you're quoting from, that's quite important because sometimes cases will have up to four or five judges. So you want to make sure that the quote that you have is the judge you're actually speaking about and whether there were any dissenting judges. So dissenting would be if there was an opinion from a judge that isn't in line with the rest of the judges. Uh, you'll only be able to use four authorities. And so you should aim to use binding cases to make sure that they support your either your ground of appeal or your response. So as far as choosing your authorities goes, 
definitely try and go for binding authorities because it would carry more weight to the court and it makes your argument much stronger. If you wanted to look back at the previous lectures on the court structure, you'll be able to find out which cases are binding on other ones and also get a clearer idea of what court you're in. Uh, the authorities that you use should definitely support your argument. And we should have, I think, already distributed a list of authorities in quotes. And those authorities that you pick should be able to create arguments for whichever side that you're on. I definitely recommend maybe reading the authority and then if you select a quote, maybe just reading it again, just to double check that it definitely supports your argument and then you can use it appropriately. So here we've got an example of a case report. It probably looks quite strange, maybe if you've never seen one before. Uh, so if we just go kind of from the, from the top to the bottom, at the top, uh, it's got the names of the parties. At the very top, it has the year on the top right-hand corner, and it's also got in the middle which court it's in. So it says House of Lords, which is the old name for the UK Supreme Court. There's a brief overview of the outcome and which judges are involved. And there's also a line kind of at the top, which will give you the key legal issues. So you can see if the case would be relevant to your argument. It also gives you the facts of the case. And then just under that, it will give you the submissions made by the lawyers, which would be all of the arguments that the lawyers made at first instance. And then after that is when the judgment starts. And it will usually have the judge's name right before that in all caps, and then it will give the judgment. So for this competition specifically, you don't have to make a bundle, but just to expand on what one is, it's a collection of cases or legislation that you rely on in your moot. And usually it's prepared by the mooters and it will contain the skeleton arguments, which is like an overview of what your argument's going to be and what cases you're going to bring up when. It'll have the moot problem and it'll also have full case reports. And instead of bundles for your moots, it will be the judgment pack that you'll use like a bundle. So during your speech, you'll direct the judge to specific cases within your judgment pack, and you should be able to give them the correct page and then also state the citation of the case because every case has a different citation. You should also ensure that they've found the page before you proceed with your argument. And that can be either by asking them or uh, maybe looking for subtle actions that show that they know where you are in your argument. Sometimes they'll nod at you or they'll smile. Okay, so I know you've probably heard us talking about the skeleton argument in, you know, in the past few lectures, and we haven't really spoken about what exactly it is. So I'm going to show you a quick example of what a, what a good skeleton argument really looks like. And we'll kind of go through um, what it really consists of, kind of similar to how we looked at the case report. Now, it's important to remember that I, if I'm wrong, if, I, if I'm not wrong, um, you, won't, you won't need to make a skeleton argument for this move. But it's always a good way, to, if, even if you make one informally, it's a good way to organize your thoughts, organize your legal arguments when you're writing up your submissions. Now, the whole point of a skeleton argument is to give the judge and opposition a brief overview of your argument. So your skeleton argument goes to the judge as well as the opposition. It's just good etiquette. Um, and the skeleton argument is just a document which sets out um, the council submissions and the case law or whatever legal authority you'll be using. And it's very similar to a contents page of a book. Now, a good skeleton argument usually has um, a couple of things in it. It usually includes a heading that identifies which party the argument is on behalf of, just so that the judge knows you know, whose skeleton argument they're looking at. Um, it also includes the names of fictitious parties to the case, uh, which party is the appellant and which one's the respondent. It'll also tell, um, tell you, it should also be able to tell the person reading it which court the case is going to be heard in. Um, it'll also include information on <clears throat> which party you're on behalf of. Are you counsel for the appellant or are you counsel for the respondent? And finally, it'll also, um, at the very end of it, it'll have the names of the junior and senior counsel names. So for example, if you're the junior, if you're the respondents, it'll have your junior respondents and the senior respondents name at the very end of the skeleton argument. 
right? So this is the example skeleton argument I was just talking about. So if you look at the very, if you look at the top left corner, it says in the Court of Appeal Civil Division. That just means that this case will be heard in the Court of Appeal. And it tells you it's a civil law case because it says civil division. If it was a criminal case, it would have been criminal division. Um, you'll see Verified Coffee Limited, that's the respondent. Karis Coffee, they're the appellant. And just below that, it says skeleton argument for the respondent. That's your title. It tells the judge whose skeleton argument they're reading. Now, below that is a breakdown of all of your grounds of submissions. In this one, you have three. It's usually between, a usual skeleton argument has between two and three, sometimes even four. Um, but you'll see that it starts with a claim. So it is submitted by the respondents that there was no contract um, formed with the appellant for a monthly supply of coffee beans. And then points A and B kind of build on that with um, information on which legal authority they're using to substantiate that point. And then it's repeated the same way for all the other grounds of submissions. And then at the very end, you have order sought. That's just what, you, what you're asking the court to rule um, as. So in this case, the respondents are asking the court to dismiss the appeal on the grounds that, and it's just those three points right there. Now, um, the skeleton argument is missing something. Can anyone maybe in the chat or in the Q&A section just quickly write down one little bit that's missing? Um, I think I covered it in the previous slide. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds. Perfect, okay, so yeah, um, we're missing the junior and senior council names at the very end. So for example, um, if I was junior respondent, it would be, it would say junior respondent Ananya Koshik, and then if Rhea was senior council, it would say below that senior council Rhea Mehta. So that's just an example of what a skeleton argument will look like. Um, thank you. Now, um, let me just, so this is just an example problem of a mood. It's a bit of a summary, really, because um, the mooting problem you'll be given will be a little longer, a little more complex. And I mean, this is a great example because I think, if I'm not wrong, this was an example. This was a mooting problem that we that a couple of students had to um, do a couple of years ago um, at the university. So we'll just go through it really quick. So the mooting problem concerns an individual who'd been given sneakers by his girlfriend. Um, some metal wire in the shoes caused injury to the individual's feet when he was wearing them. The individual sued the manufacturer for damages, arguing that the manufacturer was negligent because they breached their duty of care by failing to protect against such risks. Now, the defendants, the manufacturers, denied liability and argued that they did not owe a duty of care since the risk of injury to anyone buying the shoes was so remote that a reasonable person would not have anticipated it. Now, just quickly reading through this, you'll kind of see that the central question um, is really, does the manufacturer owe a duty of care? Now, depending on whether you're the appellant or the respondent, your answer to that will be yes or no. Um, thank you. So this is just a breakdown of um, a ground of response. So going back to um, the previous question, is there a duty of care owed by the manufacturer? If you would say, if you were, um, the respondents, you could say that the respondents did not owe a duty of care since the risk of injury to anyone buying the shoes was so remote that a reasonable person would not have anticipated it. Now, um, you do need to substantiate this point with evidence or legal authority. Why, how, why are you making this claim and do you have something to back it up? So in this case, it would be Bolton against Stone. So when you're applying, in applying the case of Bolton against Stone, it cl which clarifies that to establish a duty of care, it must be measured against first the likelihood of harm and what precautions were practical for a defendant to take in terms of cost and effort. So that's your why you're, um, you're making this claim and what legal authorities do you have to back it up. And then it is submitted that the respondents did not owe a duty of care. Therefore, they should not be held liable for the injuries suffered by the appellant. That's just your um, sub-conclusion to your uh, ground of response.
Uh, okay, so I think I'm doing these ones, maybe. Um, so constructing a legal argument. Um, the way that you're going to give your submission, um, this is the structure that you're going to follow. So I highly recommend coming back to the slideshow over and over again, saying, have I got this structure? So when you first speak to the judge, what you need to do is provide them with an overview of what your legal argument is going to be. This should just set out clearly to the judge what points you're going to make and in what order you're going to make them and which ones you will be saying and which ones your partner is going to be saying. It's really important that you have a solid introduction um, and that you kind of start strong because it's an oral submission. It's quite hard for the judge to follow. So if they lose track, they can always come back to what did they say in their introduction? What um, key signposting things am I looking for? So absolutely, you can write your introduction last. Um, but it's really, really important that you get it right. And you should start strong by saying it clearly and slowly and just say to the judge, the points we'll be making today include this, this and this. You really don't need to go into very much detail. I'd recommend maybe spending a minute on your introduction. Um, and then after the introduction, what you want to do is offer the facts of the current case to the judge. So if you are speaking first, so if you're the senior appellant, then you should always offer the facts. If you're any other person, such as the junior appellant, senior respondent or junior respondent, then you can still offer the facts um, and the judge might want to hear them if, you, if they think that some key information has been missed out. Um, but more likely than not, they'll probably be sufficient with what the senior appellant has already said. Um, and then the structure that you wanna follow um, is through your argument is that you wanna outline what's your ground of submission what's kind of the key structure you're saying. So if we go back to Ananias, what we're saying is the manufacturers did not owe a duty of care. Maybe it was did, I can't remember. And then what you wanna do is apply the legal authority. So we can see in the previous example, Bolton and Stone was used. And then you wanna tie the facts of that case or the legal principle that it established to the current case. We've seen time and time again, that mooters can kind of get very bogged down with the facts of cases that they're applying and spend loads of time outlining to the judge things in that case, but never tying it back to what we're talking about today. So what we wanna really focus on is how you apply that legal authority, those facts, that legal principle to the current case and how it builds on the argument that you create. So the last line or the last paragraph should always be, this is how it applies to the current case. This is how I want your Lordship to interpret it, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you want to do with that structure is repeat it about two or three times, depending on how many grounds you've got and depending on how many legal authorities you've got. It's also important to mention that you should always offer the facts of the case of the legal authority that you're using to the judge as well, in case they're not already um, familiar. And you can find summaries of the facts within the judgment packs that we have circulated. And then after you've finished your kind of outlining your grounds and applying all your legal authorities, then you want to move on to the conclusion, which is very similar to the introduction, but maybe a bit briefer. If you're the senior appellant, your conclusion wants to conclude what you've already said as like a recap and then introduce almost what your junior is going to take over from and speak about next. So the judge knows that you're passing on. If you're the junior appellant, you should conclude what your seniors already said and what you've already said and kind of finish quite strongly on a good point and say something like, um, it has been argued that these grounds, you know, it's been argued that there is no duty of care owed by the manufacturer and, and we strongly urge the judge to find in favor of the respondent. And um, so something like that, you really wanna finish strongly and always make sure to ask the judge if they have any further questions before you stop. Um, so always end with something strong and then say, if you're Lord, if I can be of no further assistance to your Lordship, that concludes my submission um, or something like that. So what I've got here is just a wee um, kind of overview of what that structure that I pointed out could be. So you can see in green, what we're doing there is highlighting the ground of response. So we're saying, I will proceed with the first criteria to be discussed. My Lord, foreseeability of a risk of injury of harm is the first criteria the appellants will discuss. And then what you want to do is apply your legal authority, which can be seen in purple. This is submitted on the authority of Bolton and Stone. And then what you can see after that is called a case citation. Uh, this is really important. We'll be speaking about it more next week. But essentially, every case name is followed by 
almost a citation. Um, I'm not sure if I can go back, but you'll find it in the other Boltman Stone one. So here, the citation would be, which was heard in the House of Lords in 1951 and reported under the appeal cases beginning at page 850. So that's your legal authority. And that's where you direct the judge to the bundle. So you could say, if I could direct your lordship to page X of the bundle, you will find the judgment of Lord Porter. And what you wanna do is read that quote out to a judge. Again, you'll find all the quotes in the judgment pack. So we can see there, I've outlined the ground of response and I've provided a legal authority, but what's left is how I apply it to the current case. So then you can say, my Lord, it is submitted that an important issue must be examined when relating this judgment to the current case. You can be really clear, outline it to the judge that you are actually applying it. You can say words like, this is applicable to the current case, um, in relation to the current case, all things like that will just kind of highlight to the judge that you are analyzing. Um, although, the re although the learned judge at first instance rejected Jason's action on the basis that the accident was so remote that a reasonable person could not have anticipated it, referring to Bolton and Stone, in actuality, when examining the case, the facts are distinctive enough to separate the judgments. Um, so that's how you kind of do the structure of your grounds, make it very clear to the judge, this is the order that you're going to say it. And it also should keep you right when you go to write your speech. So you'll have all these slides and you'll be able to look at that and kind of follow the same structure. Um, so around this time last year, uh, last year's um, kind of mooting mentors or student tutors, whatever you guys wanna call us, um, we filmed a mock moot um, that you're able to go watch. I'm sure Libby will be happy to circulate the link again. Um, and we did a mock moot based on kind of the problem that we've already been talking about. Um, the problem that Ananya talked about and the kind of grounds that I talked about as well. So a lot of what we've already discussed should be quite familiar to you if you go and watch the mock moot video and it kind of shows you how mooting actually works in practice, what the kind of court etiquette is like with the mooters and also how not to moot. So things like just reading off a speech or reading super fast um, and clearly not listening to what the judge is saying to you. So I've just got some reading here, um, which... I am, you can either do the reading first and then watch the mock moot or do it the other way around if you would prefer. Um, but it just kind of explains some of the key principles that we talk about in terms of standards of care and contributory negligence. There's a couple of pages there. There's also some stuff about risk. Um, it's all based on tort law. Um, so yeah, if you wanna go and do that reading, um, I think it's quite interesting and you'll be able to see what the mock moot is like and how we actually apply all those legal principles um, in terms of in uh, within a moot. Okay, we've got the we've got the link in the chat already. It's a great video. I had a lot of fun filming it last year, so hopefully it's helpful to some of you guys. Um, yes. Um, and now, um, what this slide refers to is some as Libby's already talked about. You guys will be having workshops. Um, I think the week beginning the 14th. So these are some, we're gonna be circulating a moot problem for you guys to have a look at, which will be the moot problem that you'll be using within the internal competition. And what we're gonna go over during workshop one out of the two that you'll be having is the, I think we'll be doing the appellant side. Um, yes, we will be doing the appellant side. I'm not sure, it's not in, it's not been planned by me. Um, but basically, these questions are just trying to get you to think about um, what are the parties within the moot problem, whether you can identify the decision at first instance, and whether you can see what the grounds of appeal are, or potentially any grounds of response that you can think of if they're not already in the moot problem. And also just get you to briefly summarize the facts of the case, because this will be really important and something you can keep when it comes to actually doing your moot. Um, but yeah, the workshops will be super interactive. We really want you guys to get involved. Uh, it will very much be student led by you guys. And we hope that you come with lots of questions about the moot problem. And you can also run any arguments that you have past us or any issues that you think of in the moot problem. And we'll sort of steer you right. And um, I think that's all the slides I have. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelsey. I um, <clears throat> there was a hand that went up briefly there, but I think um, I think it's gone down again. So I think uh, I think whoever put their hand up has uh, has decided not 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 to ask the question or possibly you've answered it already. But just to reiterate that the workshops are run um, 
in a different format. So we've been running these lectures as webinars, um, which means that um, you are not able to put your cameras on. And although you can verbalize questions by putting your hand up, it is a little bit less interactive, but we're going to be running the workshops as meetings, which means that it's very, very much more uh, discursive. We really hope that you will feel comfortable and confident putting your cameras on and chatting to our students. Now, we will be able to record those uh, meetings if, you, if, if you're happy with that, and we'll be able to share you a private link. Um, so those uh, recordings will not be made a public. They will sit on our YouTube channel as unlisted videos, and we'll be able to send you a private link. So um, I'm hoping that that will make you feel confident enough to um, put your cameras on and uh, interact with our student tutors um, in a much more sort of meaningful way. And yes, I was going to say it makes sense, I think, for, for everyone to cover um, Council for the Appellant um, in the first week and then in the second week, if we concentrate on Council for the Respondent, it seems to fall in a, a, a logical pattern. Yeah, but of course, if you guys have any questions like in workshop one about the respondents, we'll be happy to answer it. But um, I think the yeah the workshops will be between 30 to kind of 45 minutes and um, but really they can go on as long as you guys are interactive we've had shorter ones we've had longer ones um, and I really do recommend kind of getting involved because if you I mean even like I remember during workshop one last year for one of the schools they kind of stood up and they basically delivered a moot argument to me and the other mentor uh, and we were able to kind of give you know some preliminary feedback now and um, and, you know, obviously they got a head start on a bit of the competition and, and what we're kind of looking for. Yeah, really, really a fantastic idea to get as involved as possible. So I would encourage that. We have no questions that have come in. Um, can I encourage all of the participants that if you have questions about anything that's been covered today, um, either to put them in the Q&A or to uh, raise your hand and I will allow you to, to um Put your question to our students directly. One question I had is that um, a number of you were talking about um, referring to the um, bundle, um, qu quoting where the case comes from, the citation I think you call it, or um, for, for, for the case, forgive my ignorance on legal terminology here, um, but obviously our students will not be using a bundle, they'll be using the judgment pack, so would they refer to the page where the, the, the judgment comes from within the judgment pack? Is that how it works um, in, in this competition? Yeah, so the judgment pack, I think, is probably about ooh, 10 to 12 pages. So what you just want to say is um, you can find this case at page you know, five of the judgment pack and then give the case name and the citation. Um, if you don't give it, Professor Peter might say, uh, where in the judgment pack can I find this case? So you will be kind of prompted if you don't give it. Um, but it just makes sure that the judge is able to read what you're reading at the same time that you're giving us the quote. Um, and I recommend practicing. Um, maybe film yourself or just read it between a friend and get them to look through the judgment pack uh, so you can kind of see how long it'll take for the judge to find it. <laughs> Fantastic. We have one question, um, which is about where can we find the taught law book to read? Um, I can maybe answer that. So last year we sent out some mooting packs to schools that were um, uh, that took part last year. So if you come from one of those schools that took part last year, they should be available to you through your teachers. If in fact you have just joined us this year, we may have one or two packs still spare and available. Um, and uh, so encourage your your teacher, your tutor to get in touch with me. Um, directly and um, I can see whether or not we can we can organize that. Um, one more question. How does the opposition team get access to, I, I would think they mean to your skele skeleton argument, so how do both sides know what the argument's going to be, if that makes sense? Uh, so in this competition, obviously you won't be making a skeleton argument, but you know everyone's going to be using the same um, kind of 10 cases and you'll also be preparing the sides for the appellant and respondents so you should already really know what the other side's going to say because you've prepared both sides and um, so yeah in the sense that you won't the the issue for us is when we do usual moots the opposition gets given a skeleton argument so that they can make rebuttal points and kind of criticize the other side's 
argument. However, because you guys are already preparing both sides, you should already be able to build rebuttal into your argument easily. Um, so yeah, there won't be any skeletons made by any of the teams, but you'll still be able to kind of have that rebuttal. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelsey. We do have one more question, um, which I think I know the answer to, but I'm going to put it to you anyway. Um, how can we start preparing ourselves right now so that we can moot successfully during the competition? Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> no, someone else. It's not me or you can answer that. <laughs> I'd be happy to take that one. Um, I think you guys have been given the authorities already. So maybe if it's even just looking through one of the cases and seeing if you can note down the name of the two parties, the year, which judges are there, and, and maybe if there's a quote in there that you think might be useful, that would be really good, just familiarizing yourself with a case. Because for me, especially reading a case for the first time was a skill that I had to build up. Um, so I'd maybe say that, or even trying to get used to speaking with mooting terminology, because I think if you've not done it before, saying things in practice like my lord or your lordship can sound a little odd at first. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't think we've sent full judgments on to everybody um, yet. We've just sent the judgment packs on. Um, and obviously, um, Professor Peter will be sending on um, the uh, moot problem next week. Um, and I'm not sure whether he'll be sending on full judgments then. He may well be. Um, but we do have, there are a lot of resources available on our YouTube channel, which are publicly listed. So all of the lectures, which are, are going to be very similar to the lectures that we're having this year, but all the lectures from last year are also available there. So if you haven't already had a chance to download um, or view the lectures that we've been running this year, I would work through them in logical sequence because I, I don't come from a legal background. And as we go through these lectures, things become more and more apparent to me. So I'm sure that they will be becoming more apparent to you uh, as well. Um, and make the make the most of the workshops, the two workshops that you have available to you. They are optional, so you, you, your school may choose choose not to have a workshop. But I would encourage you to to, to take that opportunity if you can. Um, it is really helpful to try and prepare something beforehand so that our tutors can give you feedback on what you've prepared, if you're going down the right track, or if in fact you need to make some adjustments, or if you need to speak a little differently. And it's also great to just practice so there is it is really difficult I think standing up first time and speaking in that very formal manner um, but even doing it and recording it and then playing it back to yourself you will see things that you could improve and work on um, and if you're able to do that to our um, you know with our with our students over over those two weeks of workshops then they will be able to give you some really really valuable feedback on what you've already prepared Uh, just a quick note to say that I'm putting the uh, link to our WhatsApp group um, in the chat as well for you. I know that many of you have joined, but you can please use that space to ask questions. Um, I will post up little reminders about things. I'll try and put the recordings up there. Um, but if you have a question, um, I'm sure that you're not the only one who will be thinking of that question. So have the courage to put the question up there and uh, we'll get back to you with an answer. Fantastic. Well, I don't think we have any further questions coming in. There was a pregnant pause there. I was waiting for everyone to see, uh, waiting for, for to see if any further further came in. Um, but I can't see any further questions in the Q and A. Um, is there anything that um, any of our student tutors want to add to um, what's been said and what's been answered today? No. Um, I think. Maybe, okay, the one piece of advice that I've kind of got with uh, cases and kind of applying them to the facts is sometimes less is more uh, in the sense that you don't want to speak about something for five minutes if you could say it in one minute or you don't want to spend five sentences on something kind of overcomplicating the issue. Sometimes it's just best to sum up what you're saying in one sentence. It'll make it clearer for you and the judge. And um, so I guess that's my best piece of advice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> This is Fantastic. probably something more useful for later on. 
but I always have like a small conclusion ready just in case I run out of time because I think you can make your conclusion walk quite long and then you get to seven minutes and you don't it's it's up to the judge's discretion whether or not they'll how long they'll let you speak for after you've run out of time so I always have quite a small conclusion ready with just everything I definitely want to say in it so that I can just have that said so just also making your speech maybe slightly shorter than seven minutes as well Fantastic. But we've got lots of we've got lots of time. There is lots of time for you, uh, you know, for you all to prepare both for the internal competition and for the international competition. So um, don't 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 worry too much about the, the the finer detail of all of this just now. I think the important thing is to um, have a look at the moot problem that we'll be sending on next week um, to make a start. Um, even if you just jot a few things down um, and then we can really um, make these workshops work for you all. Um, but I don't think we have any further questions coming in. I can see that some of you are now joining the WhatsApp group as well, which is uh, um, fantastic. Um, I will um, send the recording of this session on to you all via email, either later on today or tomorrow. Um, I'll also put the recording up in the WhatsApp group, and I will also send on the presentation that our students have been using today as well. So you can refer back to those slides, which I think will be quite helpful. Um, but from us all in Dundee, Many thanks for joining us. We will be having our um, fourth lecture next week, and I will send on the link um, for that towards the end of this week as well. So from us all in Dundee, it's a goodbye from now. <laughs>